Hi, I'm Michael Vera. Welcome to another episode of Shortcuts. In this episode, I set out to get answers on forest people, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Call it what you will, the claims are real, the time is now. So come with me as I reach out to three of the top experts on this topic, Bigfoot. British explorer David Thompson is sometimes credited with the first discovery back in 1811 of a set of Sasquatch footprints and hundreds of alleged prints have since surfaced. Visual sightings and even alleged photographs and filmings, notably by Roger Patterson in Buff Creek, California in 1967, have also contributed to the legend through none of the purported evidence has yet been verified Many, many people around the world claim to have had sightings of these forest people. And while some of these claims are surely mistaken, identity and even a smaller amount of reported cases are less than honest. So now then, you have to consider maybe 5% of cases that are unexplained. So what are these hairy people? Where do they come from? Have they always been there? Interdimensional? I reached out to Tim Renner to get some history on these forest people. Tim Renner is an illustrator, author, and folk musician living in Pennsylvania. His illustrations have appeared in pages of various books, magazines. Timothy's book, Bigfoot in Pennsylvania, a history of wild men, gorillas, and other hairy monsters in the Keystone State is a very interesting read. So I wanted to reach out to Timothy to find out what he can tell us about the mysterious creatures of humanoids. He said in his book, though the terms Bigfoot and Sasquatch have only been in our popular vocabulary since the late 1950s, people have been seeing large, bipedal, hairy monsters for as long as we've been keeping record, for the myths of early man to medieval manuscripts to the earliest newspapers, these creatures make appearances by various names. But their described appearance and behavior seem to suggest that Bigfoot has been hiding in the woods beside us for as long as we can remember. Old newspaper articles call the creature wild men, gorillas, hairy giants, ape men, even spooks. But the reports describe large, hairy man-like creatures crying out with unearthly airy howls and leaving strange footprints in their wake. Collecting newspaper reports from the 1830s through the 1920s, the articles in this volume show that Bigfoot is not new, nor is it a phenomenon confined to the Northwest United States and Canada. Bigfoot creatures seem to have been roaming Pennsylvania for as long as anyone can remember. Strange tales of wild women abducting children, frightening wild men slaughtering livestock, and giant gorillas roaming over the hills of Pennsylvania. Huge footprints found in the snow and mud, ape men attacking humans, and where weird like hairy beings creeping across farm fields and forests. Here now, is Timothy Renner. Uh, lawyers and, and doctors to, uh, you know, just your average Joes yeah. at, who have seen these things. And, and, you know, when you look in somebody's eyes and they're telling you the story and and, you know, they're absolutely frightened when they tell you these things or, you know, you can see their hands shaking. It's uh, it leaves quite an impression. And, uh, you know, my wife was and is a, a big skeptic, but she's uh, she's seen me talk to some of these witnesses. And she said things like, well, I don't know what he saw, but he saw something. Um, no. And as far as I got into it, I, I'd like to say I was born in the golden age of Bigfoot, which was like I was born in 1970. So the Patterson Gimlin film, the very famous uh, film. Uh, uh, that oh, shows yeah. the, the creature, what I think is a creature, and some people say it's a guy in a suit. That's an argument for another time. 
uh, you know, walking across the Bluff Creek there, and I found so many sightings locally that it just it just really blew my mind and, and really got me interested in the topic again, and then I just kind of jumped in with both feet ever since. W- whatever they are, they're either the kings of evolution, if they're natural animals, or there's something a little extra about them. I'm not saying they're necessarily supernatural or they're, they're aliens or they come from another dimension. That's all science fiction until we can prove it. I don't know about any of that. And I do believe when people are seeing them, they're as real as you know the desk that's in front of me right here. Yeah. And they do leave footprints and they leave hair behind. They leave scat behind. And they can touch things and move things. So they're, you know, they're not a ghost either. Um, at least not, a, not an ephemeral thing like, like people think of when they say a ghost. But uh, as far as them being natural animals, I mean, they don't like work like any other animal that I know of. That's all I can say. And, and I base that mostly on my re- local research here because uh, I live in a county without a lot of wilderness. Um, you know, we have some we have a lot of wooded areas, but uh, we don't have any we don't have much like what's called wilderness, which means just basically untouched natural lands. Yeah. And yet uh, I get a ton of sightings here. So the question is, uh where do they come from and where are they going? And, that, you know, that's the big one. Well, um, I mean, there there have been uh, footprint hoaxes in the past, yeah. and I'm sure there will be in the future. And uh, it's it's not super easy to tell to tell a hoax. I mean, unless yeah. it's something very, you know, unless it's a really, really bad one. You know, if they're, if they're just goofy, you know, <laughs> yeah. if, if kids are doing it, you can pretty much tell. But if, if someone's really trying to, to hoax, it's not going to be super easy to tell. You know, if it's a big flat board cut out like a foot, you could probably pretty easily tell because the footprints aren't going to vary from track to track. But if someone's really trying and uh, and they're pretty good, it's 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 going to be pretty hard to hoax them. But there are people, you know, there are experts in footprints and so forth that, you know, foot anatomy and so forth that can tell. And uh, there are guys that you can show even the cast to. And I'm not one of those guys, but they exist who can look at the cast and tell you, and they'll tell you whether it's real or not, you know, based on the cast and so forth. Um, most of the time, it's the condition in which you find the, the footprints. In other words, I write about uh, one trackway that was found near me. It was two miles of tracks with a five-foot gate that did not change going uphill or down. It was in the winter. It, they appeared in the snow. It was a cold, you know, happened overnight on uh, these people's farm and uh you know it was super cold that night it was on a february night and uh it just you know somebody's hoaxing this you know that what's the reason what's what's the purpose you know there was no gary crossed a creek so you know they crossed a soup you know again they're going through cold water in this time it just it just seems like you know whoever's hoaxing if they were hoaxing that they had a lot to overcome uh when they're trying to trying to hoax something like that Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we call it Bigfoot and or Sasquatch, and Sasquatch is a little bit older name than Bigfoot. Bigfoot was coined in the 1950s, the late 1950s, and really didn't become popular, though, until the 1970s. Yeah. People were using the name Sasquatch a little bit before that, um, but in general, those terms weren't really used. Sasquatch really wasn't in common parlance until the 1970s either, to be honest, but some people did use it before Bigfoot, uh, most of the time when you look back, they call these things wild men. And the problem there is to determine, you know, they would also call your a mountain man who, who wandered into town and was, you know, let his gr- beard grow long. They'd call him a wild man too. Yeah. So the problem is to determine in these old articles, you know, what they're talking about, a uh, what I think is a Bigfoot creature, and when they're just talking about, you know, some mountain man or some itinerant or something like that. But uh, wild man reports go back really by description. You know, they're talking about something big and hairy as long as we've been keeping records. It, if you go back into folklore, there are many, many descriptions of things that sound just like what we would call Bigfoot today. And this goes back in, in almost every culture all over the world. Um, you know, that's like Tough I was question. saying before. <laughs> if, it's, if it's an animal, it's unlike any other animal because it's has features like a lot of people say it's it they'd like to think of it as a relic hominid in other words it's a some some cousin of ours you know some sort of almost prehistoric cousin of of humans others want to say it's a you know an undiscovered primate of some sort the problem with those theories is um most of what we have is witness reports as far as evidence and a big descriptor of these things is iglo 
and I, I make that uh, separate from eye shine. Now, eye shine is if you're driving down the road and your car lights hit a deer's eyes, for instance, they'll light up. You know, everybody's yeah. seen that. That's eye shine. And that's the light reflecting off of a membrane in the eyes called the tapetum lucidum. And that uh, helps nocturnal animals gather light. So that's what you're seeing. And a lot of people are saying, well, Bigfoot must have a tapetum lucidum. That in itself would be kind of bizarre because no high order monkeys have a tapetum lucidum. So no great apes that we know of have a tapetum lucidum. So that would make it very, very unique. However, the problem is a lot, a lot, a lot of witnesses are very insistent that their eyes are glowing. They're not reflecting light. They're self-illuminating. They're glowing. And that is a big problem because now we're talking about bioluminescence. And not only do no apes have bioluminescence, no mammals at all have bioluminescence. And then no known animal in the world has bioluminescence of the eyes. Yeah. So it's a very, very bizarre animal we're talking about. If it's, if, Like I said, if in, indeed it is an animal... Um, it's and, really, really difficult for me to answer, you know, what it is. It's, it's extremely fascinating. And as I said, I, I believe it's totally real. People are seeing something's real and solid, but I have no clue what it is. I later got in touch with Samantha Ritchie. Samantha Ritchie has been an active Bigfoot researcher since 2014 and produces videos for the Planet Sasquatch channel that she runs. She was drawn to the Cascade Mountains some years ago and after having direct contact with the Sasquatch has devoted herself to learning as much as she can about them. She's experienced in the IT field having been a database programmer since 1982 and is currently working as a consultant for a major company. So not some fly by night by no means. Samantha Ritchie says a, well, a veil is defined as a covering that conceals something hidden from view. There is a veil that is covering mankind today, and it prevents us from being able to discover the real truth about our human existence. Samantha Ritchie tells us of her personal journey through some incredible life-changing experiences with the Sasquatch forest peoples and learns what awaits us as we journey through the veil together. She shared a number of photos of the forest people, their logs, their sticks, their structures, glyphs, footprints, all that. So here now is Samantha Allen Rich. Her experience, and she was telling me that she was just up on the trail one day, and she just happened to see a bunch of elk, a herd of elk, which we have plenty of them up there, and they started running. And then all of a sudden, she's looking and she sees this uh, a very narrow-browed, uh, hairy hominid that's kind of running with them. And she's, and then the, her first thought, she's telling me, she says, "I didn't know we had mountain apes up here in Washington State." And then before it dawned on her that it was Bigfoot running, was running after the elk. So, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I said, okay. So I took it with a grain of salt about that, and I said, this is really interesting. I would start hearing some sounds. I would start hearing the weird howl sounds, and it was nothing like I've ever heard before in my life. And some of them uh, actually sounded like a barred owl, but, but the the volume of it, it would have to have been 900 pounds. You know, I mean, that's the intensity that was coming from the woods and across the river from where I was at. Wow. So um, that that started me thinking, and says, there's something to this. You know, and I hadn't yet, ex I'm trying to keep cognizant of your break that might be coming up here in a few minutes. But uh, the, the point was, um, so the first thing I experienced is hearing things. And then um, I eventually, um, instead of renting a spot, I did that for about a year. And I was able to locate a couple of lots with a small cabin on it, and I, I purchased it and moved the RV down there. And then, so one day, I, and I, I just put together a fire pit out in the, you know, in the yard. And uh, so I was getting a fire started, and it was starting, and it was, it was starting to get evening, or, or it was actually near dark, but still a little bit of light out. And so I had to go into the RV for a second. So 
So I was rummaging in there, and, and then the minute I opened the door back up, all of a sudden I heard this horrendous scream, like someone was screaming, and it's running. And I see something running away from the fire and running into the woods. It's running on twos, okay? It's running on their feet. And and uh, it, I spooked a young one because it was it was about it wasn't very tall, you know. So so um, I'm thinking, well, this you know, well, I mean, I'm starting to really um, and I'm trying to place these in the order that they've actually happened to me. But um, uh, at one point back in the tavern, um, uh, like in 2013. I believe that's when we had, um, and this was right before, I, it was earlier in the year, I started doing, becoming a researcher uh, closer to the end of the year and going into 2014, but earlier in 2013, I was at the tavern, and we were hearing the noises, I was coming back and forth, uh, like behind, the, the, it was like a dark set of woods behind the tavern. And we would actually hear these, I would hear the sound, and, and me and another uh, fellow, uh, would go back and forth. We'd kind of the 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 call. It would call back at us, basically. So we would imitate the sound and it would call back. It would stop and it would stop. And then you know, like two or three minutes later, we'd call and it would call again. So there was a lot of intelligence going on with the calling back and forth. Okay. And eventually, um, so that was like one particular summer. And I believe, and, and I could, um, I'm trying to keep this straight in my mind, I believe it was the following summer, uh, or spring, where we went out to the um, night, and I walked out, and I heard the same sound that I heard before. I heard this, this kind of an owl, really deep owl, barred owl sound coming from between two buildings, and it's extremely dark, very spooky behind there. So I, I got up the nerve, and I said, I think I'm going to walk between these two buildings and go in the dark. Now, fortunately, I had a little, one of those little miniature LED flashlights so I, I could walk in there. And the minute, and because I heard it, it sounded like one doing it. It was doing, just doing the call, and uh, I'm not going to try to imitate it because it just sounds awful when I do it. <laughs> but but it's it, it has a particular pattern of calling. And the minute I walked back there and I took the flashlight and turned it on and shone it up in the tree, it was just like something mass mayhem was taking place. It was just all of a sudden what was one sound was was like five or six monkey chatter type of screams coming from up in the trees. And I could hear it. Uh, it was very loud, but then it was getting louder, which indicated that they were kind of close on me, but I couldn't see anything because I pulled the light away. So I wasn't about to turn my back and have something jump on me at that point and, and walk out of there or run out of there. So I kept the flashlight pointed toward them while I backed out into the woods. I mean, backed out between the two buildings and came back on the parking lot. Well, there just so happened to be two other people. like They were on break from the tavern, or one of them was. And so they, they caught an interest of what was going on back there. Mm-hmm. So they they had a flashlight too, and says so. We kind of went back and we we started hearing the sounds up in the trees, and they were going across the the the, the different trees. Whatever was moving was moving between the trees, and and going all the way around the parking lot where we had a set of trees, pretty close to where my RV was parked. And we tried to shine the light up there and couldn't see anything, and all of a sudden it started heading back the other direction. So we went through the woods behind the two buildings and uh, the three of us. <clears throat> and then I could I could hear that the sound stopped and there was one particular tree that was really tall. And I could just kind of, I figured it was up there. I said, quick, shine your light up there. I want to see what's up there. And the minute he shined the light up there, all of a sudden, the first the thing I saw was a, gi- was a big ball, a black and grayish creature lunging from one tree to another tree and then he pulled the flashlight away but it wasn't a bird it was it was all balled up and and it was propelling itself to the other tree now is and the other, this would not be the adults though oh, okay we we definitely have a lot of juveniles that are the ones that are they're kind of like exploring and the reason why they come really close to places like ours you know because they like to observe people i mean that gets into what we finally figured out was they, the 
they let the juveniles kind of get really close in so they could actually observe us. So that was, that was something, and uh, that really, that was my first sighting, basically. And, uh, and, and so time, time went on, and I got more involved with Barb, um, because she has a YouTube channel, and as I'd like to mention, and okay. so, uh, it was, it's, and anybody types in Barb and Gabby, uh, so they, they were putting together videos, and Gabby, of course, is her dog companion, um, and so I started hanging out with Barb, and I would go with her on the trails sometimes, and, and then this was going into, uh, um, 2014, and, and I took her out to one of the trails that I went along on the river, uh, on the White River, which is pretty close to where my cabin was. And uh, there was one spot where I was actually trying to put well, like a little gifting spot, and that's what we do basically to uh, to show uh, if we want them to, you know, get gifts from us or something, um, like like peanut butter. Or yeah. it, was, it was something very small. And I set this thing up like in this one ticker spot. Well, I came back out, and all of a sudden, here's this gigantic tree out of nowhere, and it's not, and it's, it's, it's pounded in the ground at least a foot, and it's leaning against another tree. Well, the problem is I can't even move this log. This log is at least about a over a foot in diameter. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, it, probably more like 14 inches, the last I remember. And um, the strange part about that was, it's, well, you're thinking, well, it's probably, it was probably a log that was, you know, that, that died and it just kind of leaned over and leaned again. No, it wasn't there before. And the strange part about this is the, the heavy end of the log, the bottom end of the log, was up against the tree. Oh, wow. The narrow, huh? I say, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, the narrower end was pounded into the ground at least a foot. Now and, that, a, and I'm looking around and says, this didn't come from anywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, that, were, that's interesting. And now, so you, I mean, are they hard to see? I mean, people, I, I see, like I was going through videos, watching a lot of videos today on your channel. And, yeah, uh-huh. And, and I noticed that, you know, like one, I, I laughed, but I laughed because it was so incredible how you normally you wouldn't see it, but you focused in and you could literally see faces, what looked like faces. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, I mean, are they... Oh, are they transparent? I mean, what are they? How are they doing that? Well, first of all, they they are uh, they are skill very skillful. And that's one of the reasons why we um, why we have some uh, pro- well, one of it has to do with um, where one of the first big experiences that really uh, took off was the fact that we uh, on one of our campouts with Barb and Gabby, as we took the group up to the trail pretty close in this place where we go to all the time and we were observing the snapped uh, log and uh, we couldn't you know there was something the Sasquatch had to do because there was no reason why this was being done like this and uh, and while she's videotaping it all of a sudden there's a sound being made and we see something black dropping down or at least a couple of them noted well uh, Barb went back to the campground and she uh transferred it from her iPod into her tablet to see it, get a closer look at it. And she kept looking at it, so, so all of a sudden I hear her saying, oh, my God, oh, my God. And we're running on this, what's wrong, Barb? So she's, we take a look at this thing, and it's, it's sitting on top of a branch, and it's jumping down, and, and it looks, it's translucent. It looks just like a predator. Wow. So, like, from the movie? From like, the movie, it could have been right out of the sci-fi uh, special effects, but it was actually—you could actually see this thing emanating green, like the background, and it continues to do so. But then, the distortion field that that you actually see when something's cloaked like that is jumping down. All of a sudden, it whips around, and it just takes like it's so fast. And so we we even put it on a larger screen so we could see it better. Well, eventually, she got that out on the video, and it did like took off the hundred thousand hits and we had multiple people doing mouse videos on it on that so that was our first clue that something we're not dealing with something that just simply is just like a bear that's walking through the woods it just happens to be more human-like or something or like a big gorilla that's more human-like we're dealing with something that has a few extra capabilities that 
is helping them to actually stay stealth in the forest. Well, I have evidence of, of all of what you just said. I mean, uh, photographic evidence, which is a big part of my research and the technique I use to be able to get these. And I, but, but the thing, let me, let me address something uh, where people go off the premise, and this is one of the things I learned early on was shows... I don't want to pick on any one show okay. that's popular that deals with Bigfoot. One that you probably know what I'm talking about, where they go out <laughs> finding Bigfoot all the time. Um, um, the point, the problem is, you're making an assumption that you're you're trying to find Bigfoot. You're trying to find a big ape that's out in the woods that you're going to sneak up on. You're going to use your equipment to try to get sounds or try to. It isn't going to work because you're not dealing with an animal. You're dealing with an... You think about it now. How, how have they been elusive if they're just as intelligent as we are, if not more, and have a few extra abilities, especially strength and speed, and, and possibly, and, and I know for a fact, some of the things that a little bit out of there for most people to accept, the, the cloaking aspect or the ability to change colors, like, like the uh, chameleons. Uh, what you look for in nature, you try to find something in nature that's already emanating what they could al already be doing. And then you look at the science behind, well, how does a chameleon change color? And it has to do, the last thing I read was something about little silicon um, bits inside their skin that actually refract the light. And based on kind of like your credit card, you get these new credit cards where it has the holographic square in the middle. Yeah where you, you turn the light a certain way and it changes colors. It's the same technique. So they have the ability somehow to bend, bend that or, or create that light effect um, because I've had some pictures where they'll, they'll totally reflect the green, for instance, like they surrounded by branches that are green branches, and then you kind of see the outline in their faces and everything, but they they got the same green tint as the background. Well, first look at the picture, and you don't think anything's there. But then you have to, you really have to study. I've been looking at pictures, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos, and it's not like I find a Bigfoot in every photo in 100 different places, so I'm going to say that right now. Is I've been trained my eyes to spot things within the photo that I have to enlarge and I have to take a closer look at and looking for certain small, minute details, then, then I can actually apply some filters to be able to bring out that color or that detail that contrasts from the rest of the background. Uh, oh, and, and you're really, really good at it, too, if I may add. I mean, you're, you found things in the photo that probably would have took me a lifetime to find. I mean, really. If you, yeah, <laughs> if you're looking at, uh, I know you're looking at my site, you probably went to the blog site where it has show slides where you can actually go and see. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, those are some really apparent ones, and uh, um, and and of course, I even have. Uh, well, I I really hate to jump ahead of myself, <laughs> but but I do have uh, I have examples of uh, one video of an awesome uh, creature, of an awesome entity that does this, that actually materializes in front of you. And then, and then turns and kind of morphs a little bit or shapeshifts, turns its head, and then, then backs out behind the tree and disappears. And that's also on the site. <clears throat> and uh, that, that, that kind of goes in the storyline a little bit, too. And, and, of course, this is going to go along with probably the first half hour of your show where uh, I do feel we're a suppressed race. And, yeah. and I think that when we start talking about these special abilities of Bigfoot or or possibly other creatures, the VTs and everything, you might I might have to also point yourself back to the human itself and say, well, maybe it's something we can't, that we are supposed to be able to do, but our abilities have been suppressed that keeps us from doing the same thing. And you can think of any number of reasons why we're suppressed if you start talking about um, the geoengineering and all the other stuff, the foods, the GMO foods, everything that's causing our systems to shut down so we can't uh, do what they are doing. Yeah, I mean, and, but there are things that have kind of led into, um, you know, there, these things came in phases with me with they could. First, there's you go through the denial phase that they even exist, 
and and then I graduated up to acceptance that yeah here's here, there's something out there and it's a kind of like a big uh, intelligent ape or something like that a phys- very physical being I still think they're very physical but they they have the ability to cause light to bend or there's a ways to create the illusion that light's going through them but it's really going around them hence the cloaking aspect so there's ways that and I you know those are just theories because I just can't really you know without having the uh, you you can speculate on the science of how this is done but you know it's it's all you can do is guess but but I I've, I've seen the result of them doing it and I have um other credible people that have seen where the Bigfoot is actually walking across the field and all of a sudden they, they you see the grass moving where the feet are going and then all of a sudden you have you feel like you're being shoved to the side as this is walking past you. And then one particular individual um that I'm associated with who who deals with them is his dog was over in the field and he gets up in the middle of the night and flashes a flashlight and says, where's the little dog at? And the dog is out in the field, and he's visiting one of the Bigfoots. But the strange thing is the dog is standing on his hind legs, leaning over with his, his paws on an invisible. In other words, it looks like he's, he's suspended, okay? Mm-hmm. He's actually suspended there. And at one point, the dog is actually seen being carried across the field with no apparent anything holding them up, almost like levitating across, but it's really being carried across to the the bed. So I now that, that people may find that extremely hard to believe. I didn't see it for myself. I know the person is very credible though. While Timothy and Samantha shared some incredible data with us, you still may not be convinced that forest people coincide with us right here on earth humans I need more to satisfy my curious mind so I thought who better to chase down than Bill Sheehan Bill Sheehan is a writer therapist he's a Christian blogger he's also an avid archer marksman fisherman having compiled the accounts and testimonies from countless interviews taken from individuals native to North America His attention to detail is exquisite, while allowing those being interviewed to spin their tales of Bigfoot. He provides a new look at the world of Bigfoot in his writings, and so this search for the truth could not be complete without the input of researcher William Sheehan. So here now is William Sheehan. Many years ago, I don't know how old you are, how old you are. I'm getting a little long in the tooth myself. I'm pushing fifty. <laughs> okay, so I'm I, I broke sixty, and when I was young, uh, I do remember. I I don't recall if it was actually seeing the uh, Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot clip for the first time, but I think my my recollection is true in that I saw a grouping of photos of the film, in other words, still shots broken out of the film, in one of the more uh, popular magazines back then, which I think might have been like Life or Look uh, magazine. You know, we didn't have half of what we have today yeah. uh, available at that time. So, you know, the amount of info and data uh that came through was typically through a couple of venues such as that and when i saw that picture something just rang true in my soul that this is legitimate i never doubted it for a second that that picture was hoaxed or faked in any way and of course back then there were no computers uh the greatest gimmickry we even had in the camera was a Polaroid, which could instantaneously produce a picture. But you couldn't falsify that, and you really couldn't do anything with the black and white or color photos that were being taken out of uh, 110 Instamatics or 35 millimeters and the like. So to me, this thing was completely legitimate, and I didn't think for a second that it was a man in a monkey suit 
uh, or, uh, you know, as other people have said, uh, we see a zipper, we see this mm -hmm. and that. To me, it looked anatomically correct. I could see muscles moving under the skin and the fur. Everything looked correct to me as any other animal would appear, be it a moose, a bear, uh, whatever critter you want to talk about. To me, it looked legitimate, and I was hooked from the moment I saw that. To give you a little bit about myself personally, like how do I find myself uh, embroiled in this thing? <laughs> I've had numerous, and uh, you know, I know we're not talking about this tonight. I'm trying to give you a little background on how I think and who I am. I've had numerous angelic encounters in my life, and I've seen numerous UFOs. I know what it is to talk to people about these things, knowing them to be true for myself, and have people look at me with a wink and a nod, uh, and I can only imagine what they say about me when I leave the room, uh, <laughs> it, after having told them the truth. Right. And my feeling is that are some people uh, stretching the facts or lying? Most likely, yes. But I personally believe that the vast majority of people are encountering something that uh, humanity in general isn't able to encounter or hasn't encountered. They are seeing something that's real. It's moving them emotionally uh, in some uh, uh, cases to the point of selling the home that they live in. Uh, breaking down in tears when they're telling you their story. And there is something real going on here uh, that these people are encountering. We don't know anything other than what we're told. Right. And at that point, it's simply a matter of listening, weighing it out in your own heart and mind, and making a decision for yourself as to what you believe and what you don't believe. Now, as far as I'm concerned, and in uh, I'm now putting together Volume 6, uh, I have uh, Volume 7, rather, I have 6 up and running. As I assemble these, and as I hear other testimonies coming from other sources, there's a tremendous amount of continuity in what people are seeing in one place and what they are experiencing in another place. Now, just to get back to your question briefly about this uh, uh, earthly and non-earthly uh, uh, identification of Bigfoot, mm -hmm. the evidence I've compiled leads me to believe there are actually two things going on here, if you can believe that. There is, in my opinion, a natural creature, a God-created being, which we know as the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, uh, the Northwest Indians call them the Uma. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have what I call a creature being mimicked. Now, if you ask me who's doing the mimicking, I believe it's a demonic type of activity. Really? And I, I'm not going to dig too deep in that with you right now in the audience. It would just take too long and... People would probably think I was uh, <laughs> uh, half a crackpot. Hey, it's but, as good as any. I mean, it could. Who knows, right? So why well, not? There, there are a lot of people. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> most recently, uh, I recorded a testimonial that I called the Drain, and uh, just briefly. Uh, these two girls were out hiking, and they saw what appeared to be a swirling mass. They described it as oil, looking like oil going down like a bathtub drain. And I've actually heard this testimony twice now. I have another encounter in Book 7, similar. And they were watching this thing pretty much like rubbing their eyes as though something was wrong with their vision. And they realized that this thing had definite borders. It was swirling around, and they were watching it, but they couldn't tell from their position and it being up against the sky how far away it was or what the dimensions of it were until this swirling mass moved in front of uh, 
a line of trees that they had uh, a definite idea of how far the trees were. Now they knew what they were looking at was not that far away. And as this swirling mass came down near the ground, a Bigfoot appeared in the mass and came out of it walking across the field. Now, the girl who gave the testimony said it looked like a womb giving birth. Oh, man. And I mention that because I don't know if you're familiar with George Knapp. George Knapp has been following this uh, uh, skinwalker ranch thing that's been going on for many years. Mm -hmm. And I remember George on more than one occasion talking about this tube or tunnel that they got on camera. I think he said they got it on camera where an entity was seen coming through this tube or this this cylinder in in space, crawling and climbing through and then coming out the end and darting away. And when I penned these now two testimonies about just this specific thing, I said to myself, that sounds a lot like what he was talking about. It's not exactly, but the idea of something coming out of nothing and appearing and then walking away. So yeah. that's very odd. And then I've had other uh, uh, testimonials. A man and his brother, the brother was pretty well to do. I think he was a software engineer. He had somewhat of a farm, I believe it was in Wyoming, and he wasn't a farmer. He had them more as pets for his family and the children, but he had a fairly elaborate array of animals. Mm -hmm. He had a number of steer that had been killed in the field. It was one and then a second and I think a third. Uh, they weren't mutilated or anything like that, but they did have a large bite taken out of them and they were dead. So he had invited over a, uh, a local veterinary, uh, veterinarian. Uh, she came over and said that she had never seen anything like it. And I'm going to get right to the point here. The, I believe it was the third cattle or steer, whatever you call it, that was killed, uh, had dropped in the field on a day when there was a light snow covering. And the brother called up the other brother. He came over, and they went out to look at it, and there were large footprints coming to and leading away from the animal. Uh, we're talking, you know, Bigfoot-sized prints. Yeah. They walked out following the outbound trail and the inbound trail, which were basically side by side, and they came to an area where there was a circular melt in the snow, the approaching footprints and the exiting footprints going no further than where this circular melt in the snow was. So what do you say about that? Interesting? Uh, yeah. Odd? UFO? I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's open for, uh, for speculation. I believe there are two things going on here, which I said a, a little while ago. I think there is a creation, a God-created being that we call Bigfoot. I think it's flesh and blood, and the reason I say that is it bleeds, it stinks, it, uh, it, it leaves footprints, uh, you know, all of the things that any other animal or, or, or human being uh, is capable of, uh, capable of doing, it does. And then I also believe there is this mimicking going on uh, from UFOs, whatever you think they are, and I think that the UFO phenomena is demonic. So if you're asking me where it's coming from, uh, <coughs> I think there is a satanic element involved there which i won't get into with you i mean this is my belief as a well, okay yeah and, and that's what uh, i want i want to know what you think so that's why i well, got that, you here <laughs> that that is what i think because in in my opinion uh based on a lot of uh, uh different things in my own life uh, 
uh, Satan, if we will call him that, and, and I will, okay. mimics or uses what God has created in a way that flips it to dupe mankind. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Sasquatch, variably described as a primate ranging from 6 to 15 feet, standing erect on two feet, often giving off a foul smell, and either moving silently or emitting a high-pitched cry, almost like a woman's scream. Footprints have measured up to 24 inches in length and 8 inches in width. It's an awful big foot as to how he got his name. A Soviet scientist, Boris Porfsfaltz, suggested that Sasquatch and his Siberian counterpart, the Almas, could be a remnant of Neanderthals. But most just do not recognize the creature's existence. In this episode, you heard from three very prominent and well-respected researchers in the field of paranormal. Bigfoot, even the UFO phenomena. We all speculate, we all wonder, and maybe now we all believe just a little bit more. Does Sasquatch really exist? I can only say the memories of the experiences many people have had with this creature, they do exist. So join us again next time as we plunge deep into the unknown mysteries of our world. Keep your eyes posted to the sky. Keep your ears posted to this broadcast. I'm Michael Vera, and this has been another broadcast of Shortcuts.